welcome. Tonight is AIDS Awareness Unspeakable Series. Let's talk about it, part one, October 25th, 2022. We have a wonderful lineup for you tonight, including Robert C. Cooper, Vic and Lorraine Parsons, Andre Picard, Bill Mendel, Adriana Capozzi, and Rick Waynes. Again, you want to choose your language at the bottom of the screen. I do not If you don't know who HFA is, we were founded in 1994 and we work to assist, educate, and advocate for members of the bleeding disorders community. These are our sponsors. <clears throat> we have a special treat for October. In light of AIDS and HIV Awareness Month, we're providing the opportunity to continue learning and healing from our community's history. We begin a four-part series exploring the TV show Unspeakable with tonight's 90-minute session. As many of you know, HFA was born out of the Committee of Symptoms, a grassroots organization which fought for those infected by tainted blood products. Based on our origins, the following ethos is read at the beginning of every board meeting as a reminder of our ever-present need for HFA to remain a vigilant voice for the bleeding disorders community. The Hemophilia Federation of America solemnly pledges now and forever that it shall be mindful of this history and this preamble. HFA shall enforce these policies strictly, diligently, and without exception on behalf of our community who live with bleeding disorders and in memory of those in our community who have died, lest we forget. Therefore, HFA is proud to bring today's series to the community and thankful for the generous collaboration provided by Robert C. Cooper, AMC, and those connected to the show Unspeakable. Based on first-person experience and nonfiction accounts, Unspeakable is a mini-series that chronicles the emergence of HIV and hepatitis throughout Canada during the early 1980s and 90s, and the tragedy that resulted after thousands were infected by tainted blood. Due to the sensitive nature of today's topic, at the end of this webinar, we will be hosting a de decompression session for anyone who needs community support. This will be led by Debbie De La Riva, licensed professional counselor, and trained community members who are mental health first aiders. The link for that session will be shared near the end of the chat. <clears throat> At HFA, the community voice drives everything we do, and we like to begin our education webinars listening to our fellow members. Today's video is extra special and provided by the talented team at Believe Unlimited. As a warning, the following video may be triggering to some. Let's listen together. Him and her had this thing about baseball caps. They had a million of them. And she took her hat off, put it on her dad's head, you know, and she said, I love you. And then she looked at me and she said, can you promise me you won't die and leave me here by myself? What do I say to that? Between 7,000 and 10,000 hemophiliacs infected with HIV by medicine that was supposed to protect them. They knew that whatever was causing AIDS was in blood. These were mothers who injected their little boys with a product that was supposed to save their lives and essentially killed them. They didn't call, they didn't warn you, they didn't do anything, and my boys lost their lives because of it. My name is Kathy Jarris Darbison. My late husband had severe hemophilia A. We both got infected with HIV, obviously with the blood supply, and I got it then obviously through him. I was born with a severe factor eight deficiency. And then in uh, 87, I was diagnosed with HIV. I was born with factor eight hemophilia. I did find out when I was 19 years old that I had been infected with HIV through my medications. I'm a 69 year old hemophiliac. I was infected with both HIV and hepatitis C. I have severe hemophilia B factor nine deficiency and I wound up contracting HIV and HCV through tainted blood products. 
My hemophilia B is a bleeding disorder where my blood doesn't clot right. I'm missing one of the proteins for clotting. And what I do to correct that is a factor concentrate, which is a dry powder that I mix with sterile water, and I use a syringe and a butterfly needle to inject it into my veins. My dad contracted both HIV and hepatitis C from blood products. The blood contamination crisis was a situation where pharmaceutical companies were taking blood that was infected with HIV or hepatitis and continuing to use that blood in order to make blood products. And despite knowing that the blood might have been infected, they did not take precautions at the beginning to heat treat or to prevent that from happening. What led to the contamination crisis? Such a murky question. From having spent a career in law, where increasingly my focus was on conflicts of interest in the medical research community, I don't doubt that the crisis attained the magnitude that it did because there was a terrible reticence and reluctance on the part of a for-profit industry to put their profits at risk. Even when there started to become problems with people with hemophilia getting sick with this, you know, new disease, there was no big forthcoming from the pharmaceutical companies. We found out what they had done and the decisions they made well after the fact. So I truly believe that it all came down, which it usually does, to money. A corporate attitude of we don't want to do anything that's going to uh, impact the profitability, the uh, shareholders' gains, the uh, ability to pay our executives uh, an exorbitant amount of money. And so they brushed it off for as long as they could because it would have increased expenses too much to uh, make it safer sooner. In your opinion, Now, you're unanimous about this. Yes. In your opinion, these companies knowingly allowed... Tainted product to go forward, to be... Encouraged it. Knowing that people were going to get sick and die. They thought the the cost of the lawsuits wouldn't offset the, the amount of lives. They thought they'd had a few percent to deal with. It didn't turn out that way. I think this really caught the bleeding disorder community off guard, right? Like things were improving for us. We had uh, a product that we could travel with, didn't need to be kept in a freezer, and prophylaxis was just starting to make its way into the community, which meant that people were bleeding less. So the fact that this HIV came along, I think really threw people for a loop. On the phone, it was like you and your husband and your daughter, you, you have to come in. And they told us that my husband and I both had this weird new infection and you should line up somebody to raise your daughter. So it was an extremely scary time with a lot of stigma and discrimination and there was nobody I could talk to about it because it wasn't safe to talk. That's what they told us that. Like, don't tell anybody. Bad things happen to people when others find out they have HIV infection. So that was this devastation of our lives that just snowballed from there. We were very concerned that word of my having HIV and eventually AIDS, that that didn't get leaked out to anyone. I certainly didn't want any of it to land on my kids and to see them being ostracized and didn't want to see that they weren't being invited to friends' homes, that sort of thing. So we really didn't tell them about it. Back in the early days of HIV, we had a blood brother whose name was Ryan White. He contracted HIV from his clotting factor. He was enrolled in a school that did not want him to attend because they were afraid of his HIV. So he and his mother did a lot to bring HIV and hemophilia to the awareness of the public. Unfortunately for some of us, we were hiding and it made it very scary that someone would find out that I had HIV and I would be labeled with the stigma of having AIDS. It wasn't until five years later when Ryan White died in 1990 that we were asked by our hemophilia treatment center to come forward, go on the news, you know, on TV and talk about the impact that Ryan White's life, you know, and what he did 
had on us personally and the community, you know, when Ryan White died and they passed legislation to do research, you know, and care for people and all that kind of stuff, that changed the whole ball game. And then when we, you know, fought for some kind of compensation, what they gave people for compensation was literally cents on the dollar and people had to mortgage houses and lose their houses just trying to pay for this medication that ultimately killed them. And it's dark and scary and there was no hope. So to say how it affected my life, I mean, it's still affecting my life. I have to be honest, it's still affecting my daughter's life. I have like, you know, horrendous anxiety. I've been on medication for that for years. Yeah, when you're a little kid and you're just kind of told like, the only two people like, you know, that are supposed to take care of you, like, aren't gonna be around, sorry. So like, I always just had that abandonment issue that I still work on to this day at 38 years old. While it may have appeared to the general public that HIV was over, it certainly wasn't over for me. It'll never be over. I take medications every day. Some evidence that HIV will affect how I age. But I guess mostly what I deal with today is trying each year maybe to become more comfortable with the loss. You know, like there were close friends in and out of the bleeding disorder community that uh, I miss a lot that uh, it didn't make it. I personally have known about a thousand to twelve hundred people who have contracted HIV and HCV and have died from it in our community. I've been to at least a hundred funerals and that takes a lot of wear and tear on a person. I was so grateful to the gay community when I felt there was a void in information coming from bleeding disorder organizations. I had a couple of friends from that community who took this very seriously and really counseled me and could point me to clinical trials of uh, new HIV meds. So that, that was great. And, um, you know, I lost one of those friends. Ultimately, he succumbed to uh, AIDS. Um, and I, I just feel like I never... I never fully thanked him for keeping me afloat. I mean, it was a beautiful thing that these people did. We are still experiencing the long-term effects of what happened to us. And I might be as bold to say sometimes that this could be seen as a product of generational trauma. Sometimes there's this break within our community that we might not see how what we went through as a collective whole still affects the way that we think and feel and behave today. Even after our dads or brothers or uncles have passed, we may have life long-term effects such as depression, anxiety, fear, even sometimes almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder from remembering what we went through back in those days. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can use different forms of art uh, to continue the, the, the process of, of grief and to understand more about trauma. The historic AIDS memorial quilt was on display today at San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. The quilt is made up of more than 3,000 panels sewn together, each panel dedicated to names of AIDS victims. That was 1990, so people were dying rapidly. There was a group that got together and said, we would love to build to create some kind of a sanctuary or a grove or something in the city to remember all these that we keep losing. Memorial Art is trying to find a way to remember and honor the folks that didn't make it. Many times people can just get stuck, right? They just have no idea why they're feeling the way they are or they think they've gone through the process, but they haven't. Art actually taps into a whole different part of your brain where, like an unspeakable, you can vicariously witness someone's pain and somebody's strife and identify with it and it creates movement in you. It's also very restorative because as opposed to that anguish just resonating in your body and your mind and staying there, you actually have an outlet for it. My friend Rob Cooper engaged in his own form of memorial art through building the, the television series in Canada called Unspeakable and then once I saw Unspeakable I just thought that it was a great 
way for us to tell the story to folks who maybe didn't know anything about it or had forgotten about it. And also a good way for our community to revisit it in a, a way that might help some folks to, um, you know, do more work on healing. We learned a lot and we can't let that be forgotten. And I think even today, people with hemophilia don't understand how bad it was and how few of that generation of hemophiliacs are actually still alive because of the blood contamination crisis. Understanding the history and what happened and how that could happen again. I mean, we know how big corporations are, right? It's not about caring about individual people. It really always comes down to the money. I think that that temptation to, to line pockets is always going to be there. If we need to cure anything, we need to cure that part of human nature. This is a cautionary tale. When all is said and done, it does seem fair for the public to expect these companies and their government regulators to know the early warning signs of a blood-borne epidemic in the making and to make sure that information is made public. And thank you to the Believe team for such a wonderful video and for those who are willing to be interviewed. We're going to get to the really fun part now. <clears throat> Our panel tonight is high caliber indeed. First, we are joined by Robert C. Cooper, blood brother, creator, writer, director, and executive producer of the TV series Unspeakable and his special guest. Rob is also a multi-award winning writer, director, and executive producer and is best known for his series Stargate. A lot of Stargate fans included. Um, we next have uh, Vic and Lorraine Parsons. Next slide. Uh, Vic and Lorraine Parsons are patient, uh, parents and volunteers in the community. Vic is the author of Bad Blood, The Unspeakable Truth, and a former journalist. Lorraine is a former social worker. Next, we have Andre Picard. He's been a health columnist at The Globe and Mail, which is Canada's national newspaper where he still works today. And he is the author of The Gift of Death, Confronting Canada's Tainted Blood Tragedy, as well as a multi-award winning writer and reporter. Welcome. Next is Adriana Capozzi. She is a screenwriter, co-producer, and director of Unspeakable, among other projects. Next, we have Bill Mandel, who is a father and advocate in the community. He is a former clinical director in Ontario and a pu former public health manager in Toronto. Much of his work during the crisis is described in the books Bad Blood and The Gift of Death, and he is a real-life character base in the show. Finally, but not least, we have Rick Waynes, who is a blood brother advocate and playwright. He is currently the vice chair of the Canadian Hemoph Hemophilia Society and was a consult on the show. Welcome, panelists. Feel free to unmute. And we'll get started. Um, Rob, the first question on everyone's mind is, why did you create this show? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having us and for doing this, Jeanette. And, and uh, thanks to everybody who's, who's joined us tonight. Um, the answer to your question is, is quite, quite long. Uh, and mm -hmm. I don't want to take up this uh, whole panel uh, uh, answering that. But the, the short version uh, is... Well, and to be honest, you know, a lot of it, it, you know, a lot of the answers are in the show. Um, so if you watch the show, you're kind of going to, you know, get a little bit of the idea as to why, why I felt it was a story that um, I wanted to tell. Uh, the, I mean, the inciting event, just to use a little, a little writer's term there, uh, the inciting event for me was um, in 2014, I was finally cured of, of hep C. I mean, uh, uh, you know, some of the backstory, I, I have uh, hemophilia type A. I got hepatitis C from tainted blood in the, in the 80s. I was, uh, I say I'm lucky uh, that I was able to avoid getting HIV, but I luck only had a part of, part of it. Uh, the other part was uh, some very um, uh, 
persistent and, and, and uh, uh, you know, beneficial human uh, intervention. Um, and, and in 2014, after, you know, two, two really arduous and failed treatments, I was finally able to rid myself of the virus, which uh, was uh, at the time, you know, uh, uh, making me uh, not well. Um, I was feeling, uh, frankly, quite, quite grateful to be alive. And, um, and, uh, you know, I honestly never in a million years, Saturday, we were told as writers, you know, write what you know. And I was looking for a story to, to tell. And I, I never for a minute was like sitting there thinking, hey, you know, what would be a good story? Mine, my life story. It was, it was that the more I sort of looked at my life and what I had been through and, um, you know, the story behind it, the more I realized that I was alive because of so many heroes and every story, you know, needs, needs good heroes. I, I was not one of them. I was somebody who benefited from those heroes. And so, I mean, the short answer is I wanted to honor the, the victims, um, the people who didn't make it, the, the, the survivors, um, and, and mostly the heroes who, you know, who uh, uh, allowed me to live, that, who, who, you know, made life easier for hemophiliacs and people who, with bleeding disorders going forward made blood safe uh, in Canada. Um, People like Bill Mandel who are here tonight, uh, my parents, my mom's watching tonight, my mom, um, you know, her story and some of the efforts and that her and my father uh, made to, to, to keep me safe are, are chronicled in the show. Um, some of the doctors who were on the right side, like Christo Soukis and Dr. Manchu Poon, um, some of the, uh, the advocates and, and, and people who, while they were sick, were we're uh, fighting for our our safety and compensation and and justice. People like Janet and Randy Connors and John Plater and James Krepner and Ed Kubin, who are all sort of featured in some way or represented in some way um, in the show. So I mean, yeah, the reason I made the show was to to really honor the the heroes of the story and make sure they're remembered um, because this is a uh, it was a significant story and it, it was being, it felt to me like it was really never, had never really been uh, dramatized and, and certainly was starting to be forgotten. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, to your point, you, you wanted to um, highlight some of the heroes in our community and luckily we have several of them on this panel today. Um, so for the next question, and any of you are welcome to answer, uh, all of you played a significant role in the development of this TV series, which is why Rob invited you to this panel tonight. How did you contribute to the show's creation? And more importantly, what ways did the experience affect you? So I, I'll just start by maybe throwing to a couple of people. I just wanted to sort of quickly introduce, um, well, Adriana first. She was one of the first people I ended up speaking to um, about coming on board uh, as as a writer producer, but also sort of this a researcher, somebody who I knew was going to help me. Um, and at the end of the day, this show would not have happened, would not be nearly uh, as good as it is without her. Um, she's incredible. She was uh, she was pregnant at the time when we first spoke, and was like, "I don't know, I don't know if I can do this." and um, and she finally did a little bit of homework and came back to me and said, Oh my God, I have to, I have to be part of this. And, and, uh, uh, yeah, she, uh, her children, uh, grew up as she <laughs> worked on this series. Go ahead, Audrey, and talk a little bit about it. Yeah, that that's, that's right. My agent had contacted me and said, you know, you're going to get a call from Rob. And I said, no, don't have him call me. This isn't a good time. Um, but he called me and I like right from that conversation, I knew there was no way I was going to say no. And and then as soon as I started reading, I was just, you know, immediately committed and felt a huge responsibility um, to do right by this material. I think, you know, both during the shoot and after Rob and I have both reflected many times that, 
we've never worked on anything so important and I don't believe we ever will again. So yeah, this was, this was a huge learning experience for me, but also a very emotionally stirring one. And um, more than anything, I'm just deeply grateful that Rob brought me on board and, and had me, you know, play a part in this. Yeah. And then, and then like, you know, the next thing we did, um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll say this, I, I, when I started making the show and, and after I finished, I've, I've always said from the get-go, I knew I've never really embarked on something where I knew I was going to fail when I started. And I say that, um, not because I don't think the show is worth watching, but because I just knew that that the real story was so big, was so uh, important and encompassing that there was no way to compile that into eight episodes, eight hours of television. It's just such a sort of limited format that that for something like this and and you know, nowhere is that even more obvious than in the books that we used as, as source material. And, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll throw to Andre. I mean, you know, you spent, um, more than a couple of decades covering the story. Um, that, that's, um, you know, incredible, the work that you did, uh, and, and, uh, was a huge part of, of, uh, you know, the basis of our, our work that we did on the show. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's been some great movies about AIDS uh, and the band played on Dallas Fires Club, Angels in America, but they always were just concentrated on the gay community. And that larger issue for uh, Tainted Blood was forgotten. And I thought uh, I was so happy when you did this series because you're right, it was being forgotten. I would talk to people, I'd say, you know, by the way, this is the worst public health tragedy in our country's history. And often one of the biggest in the world. And people go, oh, what's tainted blood? Never heard of it, you know, because people were doing better. We had treatments, et cetera. So I think this is a really important contribution to the, the, the greater education of people to be reminded, wow, this horrible thing happened and it shouldn't be forgotten. It's an important uh, subchapter of the larger AIDS story, which has been going on yeah, for 40 years. I remember, you know, when, when you're making a television show that's called a period show about the past, um, you know, it's common for, for networks to say to you, why, what's relevant about this to audiences today? I mean, there are a lot of things that are, that we could point to, but, um, you know, one of the things I kept coming back to was, you know, this is about the truth and it's about where the truth comes from in the media and how we, uh, uh, understand the world around us. And, you know, one of the things that just totally floored me right off the bat in Andre's book. And I was so, I uh, so admired you actually for your honesty in this, in this moment, you talked about the fact that you covered the story for better part of nine years until you actually realized that people were lying to you. And I feel like that, that the blood crisis in Canada mm -hmm. was the beginning of that, you know, crumbling of, of, of respect for institutions, not that it should have happened. I, mean, I think there's, we've gone too far. The pendulum swung to the point where we now lack confidence where we should have it. And, and, um, but I think, you know, you, you kind of were, were right there on the front lines of that, that moment that really was a turning point for, for us in our country. Yeah, this was a, a betrayal on a massive scale, something we had never seen. I, I think this story has been terribly undercovered in the U.S. I think in Canada, we've done a much better job. Uh, it still has legs. There are inquiries going on in Australia, in Great Britain now. They're just catching up. But I, I think it's unfortunate that the U.S. just the amplitude of the U.S. story has never been, I think, captured in a book or a, a movie yet because it's so uh, decentralized. The whole system is, is so disorganized and decentralized that it's hard to get a sense of just how bad it was, but it, it was horrible. Um, we'll switch over to uh, Vic and, and Lorraine, not to, to sidebar her at all. She's uh, a huge contributor. Um, but, you know, Vic, you know your story, your your book, incredibly detailed in its you know factual covering of the story, but also very very emotional and personal for you. Um, 
you're the parents of a of a, a person who was affected by the crisis and and um uh you know you you were uh, very comprehensive in covering a number of other people's stories but also very honest in in talking about your own you're on mute there uh Vic. you gotta Okay. There you go. Yeah. Didn't fix it. He fixed hey, it. Vic, not... We can hear you, Vic. Okay. No? Yeah. I I just want to say that I I was uh, honored and delighted when uh, Rob called to uh, talk about uh, using the book in the uh, in the series and. Uh, I, I thought at that point that this was what uh, 2015 maybe or 16. Yeah, 15. I thought the issue had had, had played out and things were, uh, you know, getting much better. But it was certainly a reminder that, you know, we have to keep stay vigilant and uh, keep an eye on what happens with our institutions. Um, uh, some situations in the unspeakable were cl clearly based on stories from the book. So um, other than that, my participation, I guess, in the project was uh, was uh, minimal, like in a way. I mean, Rob ran the uh, scripts by me and I made a few comments, but other than that, it was, uh, one thing I did do is I had given a bunch of documents to the Mounties when they were doing their investigation after the book was published. And uh, uh, much to my surprise, 20 years later, uh, they sent them to me and said, you might want to have these. And I turned them over to Rob. I don't, they were pretty. That was, I, I don't, you, first of all, don't under, undersell your contribution at all. But those documents were like, you know, it was like us opening a sarcophagus from the pyramids. I mean, it was absolutely incredible uh, what was in there. And um, actually, that's a nice segue because there ended up being a whole bunch of documents that were directly related to or created by Bill Mandel. Um, hmm. Bill was actually uh, uh, a public health uh, a, a figurehead in at the time. Uh, also the father of a hemophiliac and actually was friends with um, with my parents back then. He was very instrumental in helping them navigate the world and and helping them make decisions about my own uh, health, which which ultimately led to me um, kind of being in the, in the condition I am today. And um, uh, he was n no doubt one of the uh, key heroes in, in the story in Canada. And and. Uh, you know, we didn't need confirmation of that, but those documents were were his story on paper. Um, it was incredible. Uh, Bill, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I think I sent you some of those things and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> well, thanks, Rob. Thanks for the uh, the introduction and, and thank you to Vic. Uh, um, yeah, it was uh, Rob called me after I hadn't uh, heard from him in about 40 years, although I followed his career through because we shared the same dental hygienist, um, which also, <laughs> I think, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, it was just opening a, uh, a floodgate for me. I mean, I'd kind of put it behind me a bit for, uh, for a number of years. There's decades of the past in there, but uh when Rob started uh, calling and uh, eventually Ad Adriana was on the calls too. And I just would gush on for hours. I mean, I just had um, stories that even, I guess that were not in the book, but they made it into the film and uh, stories and, and insights and memories. And, uh, you know, I was able to, uh, I think, help with uh, content. I did fact checking on the script. Um, uh, just storytelling, I think, is, is the root of the whole thing. But uh, what I did do was uh, I was, uh, in a way, more fortunate than others. I was the, f the father of an infant at the time. Um, he was nine months old when he was diagnosed in February 1983. And fortunately, 
uh, it was just about that time that the first um, and probably only rational recommendation came from the medical community, which was to keep all the infants under four years old on cryo. So the, the early decision was made because um, we're going to listen to a doctor. We didn't know anything about hemophilia. And after that, I tried to find out everything I possibly could and look for points where I could influence something. Um, that eventually led me down the rabbit hole of uh, blood and blood products and decisions. And uh, um, I spent five years trolling down there, um, looking for things and, and uh, trying to get people to come around to different points of view. Uh, one of the other contributions I think I made to the, to the series was in talking to Rob and Adriana primarily um, it, and reviewing the scripts to get the nuances in, um, the fear, the terror, the uncertainty, the uh, not being sure of yourself, not being sure of what to do, where to go next. There was no right answer here. Um, there was, um, it was, I remember at the time I made one presentation to a minister of health and uh, he was very helpful, but the only thing I could tell him was that we had in public health, we had advice for all the groups that were affected and vulnerable by AIDS, except hemophilia. The only advice you could give to a hemophilia or to, to someone with hemophilia at that time and the medical community did was just to continue your treatment and we will wait and see. And that was not good advice, but there was nothing else to do. They couldn't stop the treatments. And, um, and we were advised by the Red Cross that uh, don't be careful about criticizing us too much um, because people might start stop donating. And the other big fear of for hemophiliacs is not to tell them, uh, you know, you, can, you can't just tell them the blood's bad. There may be no blood. So we were caught between a rock and a hard place. This was a horrible, horrible time. Um, this, the, the process of going through this, uh, um, you know, the, the, the making of the show, uh, it did bring it a lot back, a lot back to me. And it, it was very emotional. And, uh, and I just brought up a lot of those old feelings. Um, the one thing you alluded to that just an old habit of mine, I, I will document everything. Um, I take notes on everything. I take notes on every meeting. This is long before we had, um, uh, you know, digital notes. Mine were all handwritten. I wrote lots of letters if I didn't like something um, and the letters form part of the documentation. And when you look back at it, the history, I was just asking the right questions, making the right demands, um, you know, and, and getting attention. And I did, uh, you know, in times, partially because of my position in public health, uh, I ventured out into the media uh, with stories um, Andre even did one at one point uh, me, uh, about the problems in hemophilia. And, uh, you know, so it was, it, was kind of, it was kind of a public face of this too. Um, anyway, all of that came together. I was very pleased to see, uh, see what you did. And uh, I have to tell you, I'm extremely happy with the product, uh, the eight episodes, because they captured the tone of what happened. They captured the emotions and they captured the fear and they got the stories right too. But I mean, it was, how did we live at that time? Why we couldn't speak to other people? Um, how scared we were. It was, uh, it's all there. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we did, when I say we did research, we, we did about two years of research and, and in fact, it didn't stop even while we were making the show. We were constantly amalgamating, bringing ideas in, listening to everybody we could. Uh, I'd like, we're, you know, Adriana and I are credited on the scripts along with some other wonderful writers, but we, we really just transcribed the interviews, the life stories that we heard, the things that we read. It was, um, it was a project of editing more than writing. And, um, you know, a lot of those stories that we heard and, and advice and experience came from, from Rick as well, who, who, uh, Rick and I got to know each other. Uh, when we were both getting our ankles uh, uh, fused at the same time and uh, uh, got to got to be friends, but got to be much better friends as he as he kind of was willing to open up his life and, and just talk to us incredibly honestly 
uh, about his experience um, uh, during the crisis. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> first of all, it's I'm so excited to be here with folks who've uh, meant a lot to me in my life. Uh, it, it, Vic's, uh, Vic, Vic and Lorraine, the, the work that they did with the book. Andre meant uh, sure a lot to the whole bleeding disorder community uh, back in the day uh, because uh, of the extraordinary work that he, he was doing at the time, which felt like... Uh, at least to me at the time, it felt like there was someone who was who was uh, who was uh, helping, you know, and, and someone who had a, a a platform, important work, and Bill, of course, <clears throat> his work is well documented in the show. Uh, I um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how much I contributed to the show. I, I did uh, I did I do know that the show. Um, I feel pretty strongly about memorial art. I'm working on a play right now <clears throat> that is, uh, I consider memorial art about the first 15 years of the AIDS uh, pandemic, which is happening here in Vancouver in a couple of weeks. But I know that working, doing the interviews with Rob and uh, and Adriana at one or two other points and, and watching the, and go, visiting the set <clears throat> and then watching the series was just an important, yet another of a great many important steps for me to help understand and reconcile and remember and and uh, and to continue to guard against you know future calamity i sit on the blood safety and supply committee uh, uh board for the on the canadian hemophilia society and uh you know, so that work is important to me and, and the work of memorial art, especially a, a project like Unspeakable, um, helps to refocus, you know, the needs and, and helps, helps me to just feel more grounded in, in the work and, uh, and also just personally to feel, continue to feel more, um, more understood and more understanding of myself. So I'm just grateful that Rob, uh, and the whole team uh, and everyone who came before uh, and everyone who didn't make it, uh, you know, has, has been there for me in my whole life. So thanks. Oh, you got some reactions with that one, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it's all right, I'll move to the next question, which kind of uh, segues, I think, nicely. The curation of any true event must require a thorough investigation to ensure accuracy. Um, Rob, I've heard you say, even, even in this um, conversation, that Adriana was instrumental in the development of the show's timeline and historical accuracy. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us a bit about the research that was involved in the curation of the show, and how did you develop the timeline? Go ahead, Adriana. She, the timeline was all yours. It was, it's a master <laughs> work. Okay, well... There were two really ambitious things that Rob wanted to do in the telling um, of the hemophilia community story. He didn't just want to tell it from the community's perspective. He really wanted to answer the how and why everything happened the way that it did. Um, and the other thing was that he wanted to tell it right from the emergence of this mysterious disease all the way through to the then present day which was something like 36 years. So as indicated, he um, he had optioned uh, Andre and Vic's books and they were both so thorough in terms of tracking all of the relevant details and angles up until the time they were published around 1995. So I started with those. Um, I think I had like five different highlighters that I just highlighted the books <laughs> through. One was, you know, tracking um, the Red Cross and other fractionators. Uh, one was the hemophilia community and other at-risk groups. Um, one would have been like the unfolding science and medical pieces, including key doctors and scientists. Um, I think I had one for politics and the legal pieces. So like, all these various pieces. And then from there, we read the Creever report. Okay. <laughs> um, 
followed by judges' summaries um, and appeals for all the various court cases. Um, and then we did a deep dive into various places like news, obviously, both print and video, um, medical journals, all the MMWRs, hemophilia newsletters, uh, Googling all kinds of things, uh, reading some AIDS activist books. So that was basically the basis. Well, wait, you missed a big one. We, we, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I'm not there but, yet. The testimony? Uh, yeah. I'm not there yet. Okay. So, <laughs> so that, so from there, we had a really good sense of who were the people that we wanted to depict and who were the people we were going to take inspiration from. And then at that point, we did a deeper dive um into those specifics so rob started um arranging phone calls with anybody that we could speak to and then he uh he actually paid to get testimony from the inquiry the commission inquiry of all of the relevant people that we wanted to depict so that was many more thousands of pages um was that what you're going to talk about yeah then, yeah i mean just even the process of trying to figure out the codes to the right boxes that we needed to to get copies from because it's all done digitally it's kind of like the you know computer equivalent of trying to find the ark of the covenant in the you know in that giant warehouse at the end of raiders of the lost ark you're just hoping that that number corresponds to this person's testimony at the inquiry and we pulled i, I want to say there was thousands i don't know it's tens of thousands of pages we we split yeah. those pages up amongst different writers um, and some of our assistants to just read through them and find nuggets of great story. And some of the stuff that came out of there was just incredible. Yeah. So it was like the Red Cross, the BOB, doctors, nurses, family members, hemophiliacs, like just a whole range of different angles and of uh of testimony and then that gold mine of boxes which had not just bills documents but like inter-office memos from the red cross like it was i can't i can't even tell you it was just extraordinary um and then we went into production and little things continued to trickle through including rob discovered that roger perot the former director of the red cross had co-written a book about the crisis so i quickly read that and then some of his words actually ended up being put into one of his last scenes so yeah it was just like a never and and also you know through that process, we were making connections and then connections were making connections. So we we're hearing from people and whenever possible, asking for permission to, to use those nuggets that we were coming across. Wow, so much. It's really impressive. And I'm impressed with you for reading the Creeper Report because it is not short. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip one of the other questions because we kind of already talked about, um, well, okay, I'll, I'll ask it actually. How important was it to tell the story with full transparency? And in what ways were you limited legally? So, I mean, the one thing I'll just speak to is that, and I think you had another question too, so I'll just jump ahead to, to that answer too, is okay. that we we had a, obviously in any story in which you're depicting real people in a real uh, occurrence, uh, historical occurrence, there are going to be legal issues. And I, you know, as much research as we did, that's how much time I spent with lawyers, you know, listening to their notes and trying to explain to them the research. And th there are actually uh, fairly rigid benchmarks that you have to hit in order to put something in a drama, even, even when it's inspired by and not technically, you know, real. Um, you, you have to prove multiple sources that would back up that that that's actually what was said or that that actually what what happened so that was a huge challenge um and in some cases frankly we did not get what we wanted on screen i mean there were compromises made along the way um throughout where you know we feel like we knew what was actually said and we feel like we knew what was actually what actually happened and we couldn't couldn't get it in the show so um that's unfortunate Still, though, I think the show does a great job of 
making culpable parties obvious. Yeah, there were tricks that we used to get around it. And the lawyers often um, <laughs> would help with that language, particularly in the Creever scenes where there's testimony and lawyers going on, uh, uh, that lawyers going back and forth, that dialogue in some cases was helped along by the lawyers, where it's like, we want to say this, you can't actually say that, but here's a way you can say it. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 I hear the difference. Like I I know what it would have been a better line from a dramatic dialogue perspective. The line that actually gets said sounds a little uh, maybe stilted, but that's the line the lawyers wrote. That's <laughs> <laughs> what you got to do sometimes. I understand. Did they get um, writing I mean, credits in those moments? No, <laughs> no, no, they didn't. But they did. They did allow us to make the show, which I get <laughs> some credit for. Um, Vic and Andre, I want to bring you both back up, uh, if that's all right, uh, because your books so largely influenced the show's cur uh, creation. Um, I'd like to ask you about your respective books. What, um, what was the main motivation at the time for publishing? Um, and then what reactions did you receive from the bleeding disorders community and outside of it? Um, do you want me to go first? I, that's okay. Um, well, clearly as a parent, um, I was uh, motivated to tell this story and, uh, um, and I felt that these, you know, these were real events and uh, people who were there, I, I thought should be named. The only uh, time that uh, I got a call from a lawyer was when they said, uh, you, you, you're one of the people I interviewed compared the uh, Red Cross to Nazis, and they said, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, nobody ever challenged anything that uh, I wrote. Um, you know, some people uh, called a contamination of blood uh, a tragedy, and some people called it a scandal, and some people called it a crime. And I think there are elements of all three of those things in it. But uh, uh, Anyway, my, my main intention was to go beyond the, the dry and complex uh, documents and, uh, and talk to people who really had gone through a great deal of suffering and, and uh, you know, their families being affected and so on. And uh, I think, you know, I'm grateful for those people to, uh, who spoke up and were willing to tell their stories because I think uh, that really makes um, makes a book come to life, I guess, in a sense. And uh, so anyway, uh, I also have to say that Lorraine was a big encouragement to me because- What he um, means is a manag. No, <laughs> I'm a, I, it was a mammoth project, and at times I thought, you know, can I do this? Can I get through this? And uh, it eventually happened. So, well, let me thank you for your book. Um, it's one of the first things we actually recommend when people join HFA. We say you should read this book um, and get an education. And now we're going to say you should watch this show <laughs> and get an education. Um, Andre, I bought your book as soon as I uh, knew you were on this panel and read it. Um, I was able to get it off Amazon. <laughs> I know it's not in print anymore, but some of you can still find it, I hope. Um, tell us, why did you write your book? Yeah, it's not in print anymore, but there is an ebook version that's still available. So it's much okay. cheaper. So uh, for me, I've covered AIDS. I started covering AIDS in the early 80s. So this is a, an ongoing story for me. And then we kind of just, to be honest, stumbled into the... Uh, hemophilia aspect of it, when people started to advocate a little bit publicly, there was a lot of shyness, a lot of reluctance to go public. But when people started talking about it, we started writing stories. So to me, it was something I covered, uh, for, as Rob said earlier, for many years. And the book came about as a, a desire to sell, to tell the story in a, a more fulsome fashion. You know, uh, I often say to my journalism students that I teach, we kind of do snapshots every day. And at some point in a story, you want to do the motion picture. But I do it in writing. Rob did it much better visually, of course. But you just want to bring the story together and have themes and make people understand the, the true import of this. I don't think you get that from, you know, a story a week or two stories a week. 
uh, you don't really get a sense of just how big this is. You know, thousands upon 30,000 people infected with hepatitis, uh, 2,400 dead of AIDS that we know of. These are huge numbers. This is un paralleled in our history of, of public health. And these were publicly funded institutions. Uh, this had a real impact. Anyone who went into hospital to get a transfusion, you know, your grandmother is getting a hip surgery, she could end up with AIDS. This really, people really understood this, that, wow, this is a big deal. And uh, in Canada, in particular, the Red Cross was an iconic organization. Uh, from the world, you know, back to the war years, to the Boer War, the First World War, Second World War. Uh, when we started writing about them in a negative way, people didn't like that. So the, to answer your previous question, had many threats of lawsuits from the Red Cross. But mm -hmm. thankfully, I work for a big, wealthy paper that has a cadre of lawyers, and we were able to, to, to deal with that and uh, eventually get the stories out. Uh, like Rob, there's a few things we, you know, have to keep under our hat, unfortunately. But the the gist of the story most of it is out there and it's out there in all its gory details yeah i would, I would just also like to highlight Jeanette before you continue that that mm -hmm. you know a big component of the story and again back to the relevance of how this story resonates today is that things don't happen without people speaking up and and they need a platform you know, and people like Andre were providing that platform and covering the story on a regular basis so that when the hemophilia society, when the folks in the fight for compensation were, were, were waging that battle, someone was, was telling that to the public, like things like that don't happen, don't resolve without public pressure, without the greater public pressure. One of the greatest, one of the most powerful things that I heard from people over and over and over again when we spoke to them was that even even after the 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 scandal element the crisis came to light they felt like no one cared that the hemophilia community wasn't big enough to feel significant enough to to, to even to garner sympathy or some form of restitution and you know even Rick and I would sit on set and kind of chuckled to each other because we'd be like, can you believe we're actually sitting here making a television show about <laughs> hemophilia? It's like, there's actually going to, when have you ever seen hemophilia represented on television? That isn't some throwaway joke about somebody bleeding, you know, like, yeah. um, so to have someone like, like Andre at the paper that he was at constantly covering the story that helped give the platform to the people who were risking quite a bit when they when they spoke up you know like the show's called unspeakable in a way because of that very element of the story that people just were terrified and um the only reason you ended up with a creever inquiry and the massive amounts of compensation that were paid out massive amounts but not not enough at the end of the day um was because was because the political pressure suddenly became significant mm. Um, Andre, I'm curious. In the show, we see a lot of um, pushback, actually, from from the boss in the in the uh, in the journalist uh, uh, scenes. And I'm wondering, was your boss giving you that same kind of difficulty, or did you have a lot of support to cover this topic? I, I was lucky. I had a lot of support. I had the help that uh, I think it helped that our editor was a gay man, very interested in the issue. Uh, and I remember when I, we first wrote the stories in the late 80s of about tainted blood, he said, listen, we got to go hard on this. We have to go, you know, this sounds like a big deal. We have to do a bigger expose of this. And uh, two of us at the paper ended up doing these two uh, two page spreads, you know, one on hemophilia, one on transfusion patients. And that kind of really launched me into doing years of this. Uh, as Rob said, at one point, we were doing stories almost every day uh, okay. leading up. Uh, there is a deliberate decision by the management of the paper of there needs to be an inquiry on this and we're going to hammer away until we get one and uh, it uh, affected the election in Canada it was going to be a, a big factor in the federal election so they called an inquiry to to get this out of the headlines so mm. th there was an impact of the stories but it was cumulative it was just sort of this uh, water torture test one story after another day after day and that's as Rob said something we can do well in the media and I, I would just add 
for folks in the states who aren't aware and how I just to echo what Rob was saying that without the public pressure that would come from um, the reporting that uh, Andre did or 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 the the personal narratives that folks like Janet Connors and Randy Connors provided uh, you know compensation wouldn't have happened you you know you should know that Andre is one of the most respected uh, probably the most respected health reporter in the nation and so his lending his voice or his column his writing to that was a a, a huge a huge win a, you know a huge thing for uh the efforts and, and no just to be clear again you, you know uh i don't know if i can really explain the the magnitude of that compensation no no compensation had ever been paid out by the canadian government before this was the first time and and it was, I think, going into it, believed to be almost an impossible endeavor. And somehow the, the people who were literally dying while they were make, fighting this fight um, pulled it off. Um, I'd like to get into a discussion on technology. Um, that might sound boring to some, but during the show, I, I was made to feel really frustrated at times by the depictions of these very difficult, frustrating technology issues, old typewriters and uh, waiting for phone calls and memos, whereas now technology and communication move so quickly. So um, compared to 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago, how do you think today's improved technology and social media would have impacted the epidemic at that time? Well, I mean, just what we said recent, just in this last conversation, is that we now have platforms, right? And I mean, they are they are both helpful and problematic at the same time because they also disseminate misinformation and mobilize people in in the wrong direction. Um, but like, it was almost in, it was almost impossible to explain to people like I say this often there was a scene I we we depicted the scene where Bill went to speak to that minister and he said well we'll take it up at the next you know the next meeting we're having in three months so can you imagine that now like somebody throws out a tweet and immediately it goes viral and the entire issue blows up in a matter of hours whereas mm -hmm. these officials were like we'll take it up a, a three months from now. In the meantime, people are dying. And, and yeah. that, you know, it's hard to explain to people how far we've come um, because I think we also often focus on the negative, which is a really big problem that somehow we have to figure out how to, how to, you know, fix, but, but it's incredible what's, what's happened, uh, what can happen today. One thing, uh, one thing I mentioned in the in the book was uh, a, a fellow uh, a hemophiliac from Winnipeg, who was told by his doctor after the doctor had held back the news for about a year uh, that he was HIV positive, and he grabbed a handful of quarters and went to the nearest payphone and phoned all the hemophiliacs he knew, which is today. You know, it, you just can't imagine uh, that happening today. Today, you'd be on your uh, internet warning people about what's what's going on. Um, the, I, I have kind of mixed feelings about social media, though, because you know, on one hand, it's a good way to get news out, and and uh, but on the other hand, you know, there's so much. Um, misinformation and false information that that maybe it could people could be shunned and and so on so it, you know there's two sides to that coin and um on balance i think it would be positive but you know i still have these uh, some reservations about it I, can I I jump in I here have for a mix of those two uh, those two things i think that uh social media would have driven this story a bit but I think that I don't think media would would have got we wouldn't have got the coverage today that we got 
uh, 20 or 30 years ago because uh, journalism is different. Uh, you know, I took months to do stories. That's unthinkable today. Our newsroom is much smaller. We have very, very short memories today. You know, doing a story constantly for five years, that, that doesn't happen anymore. We get bored by two days worth. We move on to something mm -hmm. else. So that this is just the pace and the size of newsrooms, the ability to invest has gone. I, I often talk to my journalism students. I, I don't think this story would get any coverage today. I think it would be a disaster. Uh, so I think mm -hmm. there, there were some benefits for the old fashioned newsroom and, you know, these campaigns that we have, we decide we're going to get compensation for this group. And, and that's what we set out to do. And we don't have that kind of activist journalism anymore. We have sort of reactionary journalism, unfortunately. Uh, I'm, Gary, I, I don't really think that uh, all the social media and technology today would have helped much. Um, for most of the negative reasons that were, uh, were put out and by, and by the others. Um, but the problem was the decision. And first of all, we had some technology. We had a thing called the, uh, operated assistant conference calls, um, which you could arrange in a day if you wanted to. But the decision, the problem was decision-making processes that were involved. And unless those had changed, um, all the social media in the world wasn't gonna help. And it might've made things a lot worse because I do worry a lot. We were worried then about being targeted and discriminated against and social media just makes that so much easier. So on balance, I would say that was not the problem. The problem was they really did want to take three months to wait till the next meeting. If they had um, had a sense of urgency about it, they could have done it the next day on the phone and they could have changed decisions. So I'm sort of, we had enough technology and we, as Andre said, we had, we had great newspapers, we had reporters, there were stories, there wasn't enough of it, um, but there, and there was education that, that never went on that should have gone on. So, Technology wasn't going to solve much here. Hmm. Interesting responses. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get to um, an episode one question because I've been dying to ask this one, Rob. Um, it's about the girl that faints. <laughs> um, the story is so, so uh, heavy, right? And um, you find a place for humor and it's just lovely. <laughs> um, the, one of the characters, sisters, walks in, sees the brother infusing and faints at the side of it. Uh, tell us where that came from. I'd love to know. So the girl that faints is my daughter. Oh. <laughs> who uh, practiced her fainting for days beforehand. Uh, it's for me. her in the show? Yes. That is her? Oh. Yes, yeah, so that's actually my daughter who faints, who oh. does the fainting. Um, she is actually not bad with needles. In fact, she just had one the other day. It's no big deal for her. But my other daughter, who... Um, would kill me probably for telling this story, uh, faints every time she needs to get a needle. Um, and so, you know, and, and I was always a bit, and I've always been a bit shy about infusing in front of people, not because I really care if somebody sees, but I just don't know how they feel about right. seeing some stuff like that and, and, or whether they're squeamish. And so it's just easier to kind of keep it to myself. And, and, but even to this day, my daughter, who's now 20, if she happens to walk in the room while I'm infusing, it's like, ah, oh, oh, you know, and can't really, can't really cope with it. So I had to put that in. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'm the guy who's going to make a joke in a very uncomfortable situation. And I feel like, uh, well, Rick's probably my partner in crime in that, in that <laughs> arena, but, um, I just feel like, you know, it's part of human nature to to use humor um, to deal with difficult situations. And there's there's a couple other jokes in the in the show that I think there's one where, you know, Ryan hurts himself and his parents are kind of running around desperately to try and get him some cryo, and they're infusing him, and you know, he's like, but it, it was it was a good catch, right? <laughs> like, you know, he, he, he's, he's not that worried about all the other stuff his parents are. He, he just wanted to catch the ball. And um, <laughs> that's another scene where we actually had, uh, there's photos of myself playing baseball 
And we recreated that scene almost to, to the letter of that, mm. those photos. Um, I, uh, I did, it didn't actually play out exactly that way, but yeah, that was, um, it was a lot of fun to, uh, to take some of my childhood memories and get to put them on screen. That uh, that scene resonated with us because one night I invited a, a pretty hard bitten reporter back to our house for supper, and David happened to be infusing. And as soon as she saw the syringe, she passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't think she was expecting that for dinner, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny how how I, yeah I, I I heard some. A young man speak uh, when we were at World Congress this past uh, spring, and you know he was just talking about how much hemophiliacs really normalize things that are out of the ordinary, and and part of it is an instinct to want to feel normal, but also just to kind of you know to cope. I find that when I meet other hemophiliacs, we have this tendency to 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 kind of joke about our are uh, uh, the stuff we have to deal with. And, um, you know, that that felt just like a real thing to try and in infuse into the show. Loved it. I see um, we another there scene be from... infused into the show. Yes, yeah, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> oh, um, okay, another scene from uh, episode one. At the onset of infection, we know um, we know that knowledge about HIV was lacking, especially in the HTCs. And we watched Mrs. Sanders, who represents your mom, now that I know, um, struggle with a chauvinistic doctor. <laughs> and she eventually switches HTCs for better care. So I'm curious to those of you um, who are affected on this panel, how did it, all of that change your care? And I'm curious what type of products... Don't, you don't have to say which one, but maybe which type of products you prefer now. <laughs> I, I, pre I prefer uh, I prefer non blood based <laughs> products. Uh, I uh, so yeah, back in the day, there were very few, very very precious few hematologists at HTCs that made the decision to keep their teenage and adult uh, folks. Uh, or return them to cryoprecipitate, which uh, uh, did and would have made a, a big difference in the amount of transmission. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> most of us, most of the advice that we were getting from most of the HTCs at the time was to stay the course, that uh, you know, not treating was uh, not an option, and that uh, this was the best product available, and that it was... <laughs> I'm safe. I remember one uh, one day I got a phone call from my nurse, and she said, "Rick, I don't suppose you have <laughs> so I don't suppose you have any of this lot number left in your fridge." <laughs> and I looked in the fridge, and uh, there wasn't anything from that lot number. He said, "Yeah, I I suspect I I knew you would have used it already." <laughs> so, um, I think everyone was scrambling. And and uh, and uh, it caught everyone very off guard, uh, and um, so uh, yeah, I I don't have any um, any regrets about my treatment. Um, I mean, obviously, going back to cryoprecipitate might have meant I didn't get uh, uh, Hep C and HIV, but uh, I did. Um, and it wasn't a guarantee. Like that's the thing. No, no, no. Of course, Bill, yeah. Bill, Bill often reminded us of that. That it's not. It was never. It was never. No, no, no. Or it was a. It was a. It was a numbers game. It was a percentage thing. Yeah. And even on cryo, I mean, we put this in the show. It's one of the, you know, incredible things that that Bill used to do. I'm not. You know, I'm not. Maybe not even supposed to say he really did this, but okay. It's okay. He used to drive to other <coughs> areas to get safer cryo so that it was, you know, within the bigger cities, you would have more odds of contamination with even within the cryo supply. And so he would drive outside those sort of less, you know, populated areas to get safer cryo. Um, that, that it wasn't a perfect system, believe me. And, and, you know, it wasn't like 
everybody who made the decision to stay one way or the other was, was, you know, wrong. Um, but yeah, my mom specifically had it out with the, uh, the doctor and, and, and when she didn't get the answer she wanted, we, we moved and, uh, we were very lucky because I was actually, you know, at the, uh, under age for moving to an adult, uh, program and, uh, was, was, you know, very lucky that they uh, they were willing to to take me on. I, I spent most of uh, five years, the next five years, making those kinds of decisions, always looking for what I thought was the safest product. Um, I did a lot for the community, but my first responsibility was always to my son. And um, when eventually, uh, the, the true stories about the cryo, and the, there was just the whole story about female cryo, um, which is a, something I advocated for for a long time. Um, and when we finally did switch over to heat treated concentrates, and there was a period of time where um, it, it, there was some silly decisions made about, uh, it was following the armor situation where uh, they decided rather than the armor heat treatment, it was that whether there was screen plasma in the uh, boxes or unscreened plasma in the lots, and um, I just made my business to A, not use armor, and B, find out which boxes had screen plasma versus unscreen plasma, and then went and searched for those lot numbers in different hospitals, and I got them. And uh, you know, it was just, uh, you did what you could. And it was, you know, there was a point where I remember um, concentrates that were made, they, these, these are just on, based on the labels they put on it, some concentrates were from volunteer Canadian plasma. Other concentrates were from commercially collected um, uh, American plasma. But at one point, I remember the commercially collected had all sorts of screening tests on it, and the volunteer didn't. And it was a toss-up, which one is safer? I don't even remember which one I chose, but you went after, I just would go follow that as much as I could right till the end, till we got to... Um, wet heated, the steam heated product, which is finally safe. All right, we are getting close to our time. So I'm gonna ask all of you one more question and then we're gonna to switch to some um, spontaneous questions that have been building in our Q&A and there's some good ones. Um, but I will say to the panelists, if you can't get in there and answer any, uh, feel free. The last question I have um, is, um, it's a really privileged idea to think that AIDS and HIV is over. Um, and we've even heard people in our community suggest that. So I'm just curious what your response is when you hear someone say that. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go first that I think one of the things that is important to remember is that those of us in first world countries have different access to different, more safer products than people do in other parts of the world. So we have to make these comments in, in relation to that perspective. Like, you know, I was shocked to learn this spring at World Congress that the only type of product people have in Thailand is cryo. These are people who are still on cryo. Like, so we can't really blanket discuss the safety of blood as though it's universal. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, and we see that across the board in all types of medical interventions. You know, there's countries that have far less access to COVID vaccines, you know, like there, it's just not equal. So yeah, there is privilege. There's definitely privilege that's, that's involved here. And, and, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done by those who are in those privileged situations to make sure that access to safe products is, is universal, is universal. Having said that, I mean, here in Canada and, and to my understanding in the U S as well, um, you know, we've made incredibly good strides towards making blood products for people with bleeding disorders safe. Um, however, however, 
There is no high ground that you can rest upon in in these times, right? It, it, just because something is is what it is now doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. And so, you know, we talk about this all the time on the Canadian Hemophilia Society board that you know our man part of mandate is to keep blood products safe. That is, you can't assume that um, everything is going to remain the way it is today. Well, first to be perfectly clear, um, hemophilia products made from recombinant um, factor is I have no human or animal proteins in them at all and are perfectly safe um, unless some manufacturing glitch goes off someplace. But that hasn't happened for 35 years. Um, so that's, that's a good place to start. But like Rob said, the, the, there are questions, there are other questions, even in, in uh, Canada and the US, and they're about um, access to even better products that uh, last, last longer, less, fewer infusions, um, new products that have uh, um, less you know, administration, we can do them sub-Q uh, instead of uh, in, in, in deep injection into the vein. Um, and of course, gene therapy coming along. And I think the, the Hemophilia Society in Canada, and I'm sure in the US, has been very vigilant about making sure that this access stays, uh, stays there um, at a reasonable cost, which in Canada, there's no cost to us for products. So um, we wanna keep um, these things flowing in the pipeline. And sometimes the arguments, we are so far from blood now uh, that the provinces are starting to question what's the difference between uh, this product you want to use and a very expensive cancer drug, which is also a pure drug. And they're right, it's a fine line, but it's sort of substituted. It's up to the hemophilia society to be very vigilant to keep on that argument to make sure that everybody gets what they need. And that's just for us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's also a responsibility. I think for the uh, uh, for the the survivors of all this, they still have uh, they need treatments, they need care, they need sympathy, and they need advocacy. And again, um, it's the organized group, the hemophilia societies, that need to advocate on their behalf um, continuously with governments at different levels to make sure what they need is in place. And then Rob is you know tell you seventy five percent of the world does not have access to uh, to modern concentrates. And um, we do what we can for those hemophiliacs. I know uh, in Canada, we even, uh, this goes back some years from, you know, even when we did it, but I was still involved with the Canadian Blood Committee when we did this, um, was we had excess uh, cryo or that was coming out of our plasma because we're a country that was entirely on recombinant products. So we, it took years, but we arranged for that cryo, uh, that plasma to be processed in another country to make concentrates to give away. And um, it's little things like that, that, you know, you can, you can try to do and it, it doesn't cure the whole world, but it, uh, it makes it dead. Thank you. Well, we're going to switch over to some spontaneous questions. I know we're going over a time. Um, part of that is because of our earlier glitch. So I hope um, some of you will hang on with us. We have some good questions here. Um, this was first one is to Rob and Adriana, but I think anyone could probably answer. Um, the program did such an incredible job of touching upon so many different angles of the blood contamination crisis and the ways it affected families. But from your knowledge of what was left on the cutting room floor, I like that. Um, are there facets of the story that you wish you could have included or further expanded? Adriana, you want to take that? Well, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't know where to start. It was so much. There was so much that we wanted to tell that there wasn't room for. One thing that I will say is that, you know, getting into the complexity of um, some of the legal pieces and some of the medical pieces, like, it was fascinating for me to look at the differences in terms of Canada and the United States and how some of the very things that we value also contributed to our story. So for example, you know, as we've touched upon, 
um, hemophiliacs don't pay for blood products here in Canada, but they also don't get to choose their products. So, you know, at the time that this was going on, um, choices were being made as to which per which products would be purchased. And that was sort of like what was safe at the time that was the least expensive, essentially. And versus in the United States, where when something like heat treated came on the scene, you know, before it was proved whether or not it was effective or not, because there's a free market there and people were paying for product, um, you know, if if some people are buying heat treated, suddenly all of the companies had to go in that direction to be competitive. So it like that kind of thing was really fascinating. Um, and, and just big questions in terms like that have big implications in terms of like the Creever uh, commission, you know, there was a point where people were asking like, how do you tell the difference between the truth and, and a lie? Because people are so afraid of, culpability. So even though the Creever investigation was not about pointing blame, it was about getting to the bottom of what had happened. Can mm -hmm. you really find out what has happened in a situation when people are afraid of being held accountable legally? So there was just like such a richness to the education in terms of the systemic issues surrounding all of this that I think um, you know, always play a role in our and be and our continue to be relevant today. Um, so I still think about all of that stuff on a daily basis. So we didn't actually have the money uh, to to shoot a bunch of stuff that we didn't put in the show. Um, but I think we certainly tried to address this aspect of it, but it's one that I've I think come to understand even now much better than when I made the show. And that is the impact of these types of tragedies on the people around the people who are directly victims. Um, the, the mental health issues, the, the wives, the sisters, the children of the people who, who were infected um, and or died. We saw it, we saw someone talk about it in the video before, before, mm -hmm. you know, we started this panel, um, how much generationally there are reverberations from something like this. And, and uh, you know, that that's not something you, you know, the, the Janet talked quite a bit about the fact that Janet Connors was, was Randy's uh, uh, wife and a huge advocate. She was co-infected, she was infected by Randy, but she did not receive compensation. Mm. So, you know, and that's just about the money. Well, let's not talk about, let's, let's talk about the, the, the mental anguish of having to deal with, I mean, you know, I think we have Lorraine here can speak to being the mom, you know, of, of, a of a hemophiliac and the, and the sort of toll it's taken. Uh, David Page, um, who was uh, head of the CHS for the longest time and was part of the compensation fight. You know, he just recently was uh, spoke at world Congress and he talked about what his wife has been through. Never mind what he's been through. You know, what has his wife been through as, as, as the support for him? How has it affected her? I know when I was on medication for hep C and miserable for more than a year and couldn't work and really couldn't leave my bedroom, my wife was raising three young children. So, you know, by herself, basically, and, and also worrying about me. So it's those circles, the ripple effect of the circles that, you know, ripple out from, from a tragedy like this that um, get forgotten. That kind of leads well into this next question, which is how did all of you address your children? Um, and explain everything to them. Um, <laughs> you know, my kids, uh, until they, frankly, until they watch the finished show, I don't really? think really knew. Uh, yeah, my, my, one of my daughters was actually quite angry because she 
was like, why didn't you tell us what you were going through? And I was like, you were, you were a kid. We didn't want you to worry. And, and, you know, and it wasn't like we were hiding it, but at the same time, I think, I think we were trying to kind of downplay what was going on. And, um, you know, I think we do talk to them about the political side of it and, and the issues surrounding it. But for them, watching the show was actually a bit eye opening, not just to the world side of the story, but but even what 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 their dad and mom were going through. Hmm. Just, I think you wanted to. Yeah, I was just going to say just to add to to that. We didn't say anything. We told David, don't say anything. We saw the information coming from the state on Ryan White. Um, we knew we didn't want to get involved publicly at all, and we didn't want anyone to know. But when we did start to talk, it was really empowering. But our younger, our second youngest daughter, had exactly the same reaction as Rob's daughter. She was very angry with us, really angry. And, but our youngest daughter um, was an advocate. She turned into an advocate at the age of, a, in grade nine. And she was a wonderful advocate. She was wonderful for AIDS and for hemophilia. And she fought in Ottawa. She went to the- Canadian um, Blood Agency. It went to the Canadian Blood yeah. Agency. She gave a talk on the safety of blood products. She did, she did so much and then went as well to um, Durban to the World AIDS Conference in Durban. So different kids, I guess, react, our, our kids anyway, reacted differently. David was the one who told us and he went berserk for a few years, got on, into drugs, got into other things, but then he came back as well. And so did our middle daughter. So that was our experience. It was hell actually. <laughs> but we I got- I can feel that. <laughs> anyway. Thank you for sharing it. Um, Lorraine, I hope you won't mind. I think one of these questions is really for you. Um, and since we're already talking with you, I'll, I'll skip to it. Um, if you could say one thing to women who were um, infected or to moms who infused their kids during that time, what would you say? Well, some of those mothers, I guess, have lost their children. So what do you say to a mother who has lost their children? You know, I mean, the, the thing is, is that these, these events changed us. And they're etched into our soul. They're branded into our soul. You know, we'll never, ever forget them. And we'll never forget all those who died. So we can stand in solidarity with them. And that's all we can do. We, we're sisters. If, if you've gone through this, we have something in common. That's all there is to it. We have something very deep in our souls in common. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. I keep saying uh, Italian. I can do this. I can cry you, if I want. <laughs> you are among family in this space, even virtually. So, And you're getting a lot of hearts. I hope you see that. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll ask one more question. I would just say, I, would just, I, would, I just okay. wanted to say one last thing uh, to that yeah. effect is that what, what you've just seen is... You know, first of all, thank you, Lorraine, for for sharing that and for just being so so honest and open with your your feelings. Mm -hmm. um, but that is that is the experience that that Adriana and I had for for years in in speaking to people and in, in in doing the research. And as much as I am happy with the show and it being out there the experience of making the show of meeting the people I've met and, and learning about what I did and just hearing stories and the way people feel it just far, far beyond, you know, any satisfaction I get out of a compliment on the show or, or even just having the show out there and existing. I mean, 
the the journey and and the experience of of making the show and learning about meeting all these people has been you know the best experience i've ever had oh, that's actually answering this last question what was it like to see your stories on screen um i think i think you did it well but if anyone else would like to say what was it like to see your stories uh, unfold on screen rick any final words well yeah i mean I, first of all i wanted to say how lucky i mean i don't know that the story would have been told if rob hadn't take taken it on um but how lucky are we that someone from our community made this series that is uh, important and so i'm i'm real grateful for that i know that <clears throat> i know that again like i said earlier um you know i think we all want to be seen at some at some point especially when we're struggling and this was a a, a really big struggle for our community i lost my uncle lost lots of friends as many of us did and uh and some of those um yeah some of those wounds are uh, uh, take a very long time to get sorted out and perhaps never will but each <clears throat> each step uh helps with that and i found um unspeakable to be an important an important step in me feeling better about those years and uh <laughs> I think the only thing I would add is that we hear Rob in particular hears a lot from folks in the bleeding disorder community um, that uh, they're just not able to watch it and haven't been able to watch it. And I get that. Um, I wish we had, I wish, I, I would wish for our community that we would um, find the, the right tools to create the, the spaces for folks to be able to lean in to what happened a bit more so that maybe some of those harder feelings can be uh, not not gotten rid of, but just find safer places for them to live, you know? And uh, so unspeakable for me anyways, has been an important one of those steps. And, and you know, a, a panel like this, you know, it's a, it's a healing by a thousand <laughs> interventions. And this is, this is a good one. So thank you. Mm -hmm.